Welcome to the third She Opened the Door, Ask the Expert series. I'm Francine Glick, Barnard 77, and co-chair of the She Opened the Door committee. The She Opened the Door, Ask the Expert series features Columbia alumni speaking about their experiences, challenges, and achievements in an interactive setting with audiences from across the globe. I am now pleased to introduce our mo moderator, Kate Konechny, Pope, SPS 13, and a member of the She Opened the Door Committee, and our speaker, Tamara Grusberg. Tamara is a Columbia University alum, GSAS 97, and Business 06. She holds an MBA and a Master of Arts in Statistics from Columbia University, and a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and Sociology from Kyiv University in Ukraine. She's an expert, analytics expert, executive, with 20 plus years of experience in guiding organizations through rapid data transformation and growth. As VP of Strategic Services at Action IQ, Tamara works with leading brands to help them realize the value of insights that live in their data. We're looking forward to hearing from Tamara. Near the end of today's program, we'll have an audience Q&A. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. We'll try to get to as many as we can in the time we have. Kate, I turn it over to you and tomorrow for what's sure to be an engaging conversation. Thank you, Francine and tomorrow. Welcome. It is such a pleasure to have you here with the She Open the Door community. It's an exciting chat today as we delve into the intersection of AI and MarTech. But first, let's begin with your time and experience at Columbia. How has your education and connection with Columbia influenced your career trajectory and if you were a student at Columbia today, what would you focus your studies on? Thank you, Kate. Um, I came to Columbia after graduating college in Ukraine, actually back in Soviet Union. Um, and I uh, got a very strong education in mathematics and sociology. It was pretty theoretical, I should say. For five years straight, I studied a lot of math. So when I came to Columbia, um, statistics program in particular gave me exposure to the practical aspects of the field and also allowed me to combine my interest in math and social sciences um, as an area of application through projects and exposure to internships. Um, and then, as you heard, uh, after a few years, I was fortunate to come back for executive MBA program at Columbia. And it really strengthened uh, even more my uh, perception of Columbia as an outstanding academic institution with very strong ties to practical applications of learnings. Um, so um, obviously huge, huge impact on my career path. Um, and um, if I were to study at Columbia today, I think it would still be data analytics, insights, um, any word you can use here. But um, with all of the developments in machine learning and AI that now span a much wider range of industries than it was 25, 30 years ago, I'm particularly fascinated with all of the advances that happened um, in the um, application of these findings in medical sciences. So I think it's it's a really huge opportunity um, to just improve, uh, you know, medical outcomes, uh, consumer experience within this area with data and analytics. So I think if I were to study today, that would be an area of interest for me. Things are so different today than they than they were twenty years ago. Uh, following up on that, for those of in the audience who are considering a similar path, what skill sets or qualities do you believe are essential to have a meaningful impact in this field now? So, um, of course, first and foremost, you know, strong expertise in the ground in your specific area of study. Uh, but outside of that, um, I would encourage people to figure out or clarify the area of application 
that you are passionate about or where you're looking to solve the problems for. Um, and really educate yourself on the respective context. Um, for me, I think it was very insightful when I finally figured out the importance of being able to answer the question, what does it mean, right? What, Whatever you're finding or uh, what you're designing, uh, what, you're, what you're exploring, what does it mean for the area where you're looking to apply your apparatus? Um, there is this grossly overused term telling stories with the data, right? And it could be, from my point of view, frequently mishandled because you don't want just to tell the stories that don't really have grounding in the data and you don't want to fudge the data, obviously, to feed the stories. Um, but um, I think it's super, super important to be able to relate to people why what you're doing is valuable in, in my situation, why your analysis is valuable, right? What does it mean? How it can impact people, impact business outcomes. Um, but if you can do it, then the most brilliant thing that you personally discovered or analyzed or designed will just remain with you and will never see the light of the day, right? So ultimately would not deliver the impact that you're looking to deliver. Um, so impactful storytelling is super important, I think, in any area, but definitely in the area of my expertise. And I keep working on it every day. Switching to after Columbia, you had an impressive career in data analytics. And then you made a significant change to AI, focusing specifically on the design of scalable solutions across industries. Can you share with us your path to your current role? Um, of course. And, um, you know, it's been a significant change, mostly because the industry changed significantly. I would argue that in many instances, we use these terms um, not necessarily interchangeably, but there are, you know, different interpretations of what data analy analytics, predictive analytics, machine learning, AI. Um, at the end of the day, what really changed over the years is just the scale of information that we can process, right? Efficiencies of algorithms that we are applying to this data. Uh, ultimately, when I started almost 30 years ago, um, I started in financial industry, in banking, in credit cards. Um, and um, I was working on models to predict very specific outcome. Will the person open the credit card and how likely this person is to pay on this credit card, right? So these types of predictive models uh, were built on kind of limited set of data and we would refresh these models not very frequently and maybe redevelop them once every year and maybe would read the results of the model performance on the monthly basis. Uh, now switching to today, I am helping our clients to develop multi-tier solutions, figuring out probability of somebody to react to a specific piece of content at this given moment through this particular channel and understanding what is the next step that this person is going to take. So definitely the outcomes became much more complex as well as just the frequency and the um, immediacy of understanding if your models are working or not. Um, Conceptually, though, I would say you're still thinking about figuring out what's right for this customer at this particular moment in time. And how have those past experiences of yours shaped your current approach at Action IQ now? Uh, well, um, my all of my experiences have been uh, extremely helpful uh, for my current role at Action AQ. So Action AQ is the um, 
technology company, right? So we uh, created a software, um, very exciting, sophisticated software in the area of uh, customer data platform and customer experience hubs. Um, and we have clients across multiple industries of clients of different sizes that are using our software. And for me, it's the first um, vendor size side experience, right? So I came to Action IQ from what I would call a client side. I worked uh, again across different industries, but um, on the brand side, started in financial services, and then I worked in re omnichannel retail, um, and then media and publishing. So now at Action AQ, all of this past experiences really are super helpful to me because I can work with clients from across the industries and understand their specific issues, their specific problems, and how our software can help them within the context of their business. Um, so from that perspective, I think it's it, it's a pretty impactful path and really helps me uh, in my current role. Uh, and again, going back to storytelling, right? Not just selling the software and not just telling people that, you know, you have all of these amazing capabilities, uh, making them see how it will actually drive their business forward um, is a very important thing. Thank you. Now, recently we have heard a lot about AI, machine learning tools, specifically ChatGPT has really been a hot topic across these industries. How do you see this benefiting the marketing sector and how can it also coexist with the human approach? Uh, Thank you. It's it's a great question, and I would argue a much better one than, let's say, very frequently I hear, when do you think ChatGPT will be able to replace all of the marketing jobs? <laughs> and um, I am a big believer that um, new developments in, a, in AI, particularly generative AI, and ChatGPT is one of them, um, are super exciting and definitely will change um, in particular marketing, but I'm very far from thinking that it would be able to replace humans or replace marketing jobs. It would change marketing jobs. And I think it would change them for the better because what all of these advancements in AI are really doing at this point is allowing for streamlining and automation of more um, manual repetitive tasks, right? And allowing marketers in particular to focus on more creative problems um, and as a result, create more impactful solutions. But I don't see how uh, in near or even medium future, all of these developments would be able to completely replace marketing jobs because you know you don't want you want streamlining but you don't want uh homogeneity and uh if chat gpt all of a sudden will start creating um marketing copies across organizations in different industries, they will all start sounding the same at some point. So <laughs> uh, I think uh, it's a great assistant and marketers would need to figure out how to best use this assistant to their advantage. Um, so. Good news to hear. <laughs> <laughs> and again, exciting. It's It really is exciting, I think. How do you see more specifically, AI improving those personalized messages and automation in the marketing campaigns? Uh, so it's not really, again, going back to the question of scale, right? It's not like all of a sudden we just realized that we have this problem of personalization and we want to solve it. We've been solving it and working on this uh, for years, right? Um, 
as a matter of fact, so I mentioned that Action AQ is the uh, software platform in the so-called customer data platform, CDP space. And sometimes I tell people that in my career, I used to manage human CDPs, meaning that uh, I would manage a group of people that would access data, get the insights from the data and provide them to business users. And now the platforms in the CDP space, Action AQ in particular, allows business users to get to the data and get the insights from them directly. So people with more specialized skills, again, can focus on more interesting and impactful problems. So that's basically what we see in the area of automation and personalization as uh, more and more very core, but uh, repetitive tasks like uh, you know working with the data, running initial analysis, understanding the shape of the data um, can be automated with specific tools. And these tools are getting more and more advanced with time. Um, analysts and data scientists and marketers can focus on kind of next level iteration of the problem and come up with something more specific, more impactful, really truly personalized. Yes, I'm sure you heard the question um, or slogan or statement. We want to reach out to the customer with the right product at the right time through the right channel, right? It's been around for years and years and years. And uh, what advancements in uh, machine learning and AI are doing is pretty much bringing us closer to this, to this idea. Going a little bit away from work into personal work-life balance, you are originally from Ukraine and moved to the United States after college. Can you share with us your deep involvement with the Odessa Peace Fund? Um, yes, yes, of course. Um, so it's a big part of my life now, even though I spent um pretty much my entire adult life in the United States, but I have a lot of very close friends um, back in Ukraine from my high school and college days, um, and their lives changed dramatically uh, in February of 2022 when the war with Ukraine started. Um, so my friend, um, Irina Sheinfeld, uh, an artist in New York who is originally from Odessa, um, and her late husband, they organized a non-for-profit organization, Odessa Peace Fund, um, pretty much uh, in the early days of the war. Um, and I started collaborating with them um, after Vlad's untimely passing. I became the president of the fund, and the work of the fund... Um, started in Odessa in the region, but very uh, quickly we expanded to cover um, regions across Ukraine. Uh, we are working with um, medical professionals and humanitarian organizations that we know personally. Um, and we organize uh, delivery, sourcing and delivery of um, tactical meds, humanitarian aid, and uh, medical supplies to uh, the people in Ukraine. Again, we uh, developed a network here in the United States so we can source these um, supplies in the most efficient way. And um, I think the most important part for us, for me personally, is the fact that we know the people that we deliver this aid to. It's um, very specific, very targeted. We respond to their direct needs. So we know that whatever funds we collect and uh, supplies that we source um, go directly to the people in need. Um, and I involve both of my daughters into this work. Um, in general, it's you know, it's it's kind of hard to sustain the attention to something that doesn't 
uh, relate to people in United States directly, right? So I find it um, very important for me to keep talking about it, to keep raising awareness, to make sure that, uh, you know, we're bearing witness and we are doing what we can to um, relieve the suffering. Thank you for all your efforts in that and explaining it to us today. We are going to do one final question before we turn it over to the audience Q&A. So if you haven't had a chance to put your question into the chat box, please do so now. Lastly, we have heard about your personal passion for archaeology and visiting historical sites with your family. Can you share a recent favorite and how your passion came about? Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. It is. Um, it's my uh, long life passion. And at, at some point, I was seriously considering what my career path would be would it be mathematics or history and then you can uh, think of it as, as a bit ironic because in my current career I'm um, trying to not necessarily predict the future but to a certain degree figure out what's going to happen next from the business perspective right and how to help people take advantage of these opportunities while well, with history you're gaze would be directed backwards to whatever already happened, right? And you can be more optimistic thinking that based on the lessons learned, people will design the future based on these lessons. And unfortunately, in light of the current global events, it's hard to be very optimistic in the moment, right? Because the horrible things are happening all around the world. And then the most current one in Israel is just heartbreaking. Um, but, you know, again, all we can do is to be present and see what we can do and still try to learn from history. So in terms of my most recent trips, uh, I think my trip to Egypt in 2019 with the family, and then trip to Greece in 2022 were both absolutely mind boggling and, and made a huge impact on me. Um, just being there, being in the presence of this ancient ruins. I mean, archeological museum in Athens is, is something that I think after this museum, I need the break and I can't go into any archeological museum for quite some time. Um, but also what was super important to me is to share it with my family, with my kids, uh, seeing, uh, trying to teach them something, but also seeing a lot of things through their eyes as if for the first time, again, gives you a perspective and grounding and in what you're learning and how you want to talk to people about it. Thank you. Well, I think we have some great questions from the audience that are coming in. Our first one is a little bit of a two-parter. How do you keep up to date with the market and news? And a follow-up to that, what resources do you recommend for developing leadership skills, specifically for someone who is early career engineer aspiring for management? Um, so um, how I keep up with the market, um, there are a lot of great uh, resources, online resources, and marketing influencers that I um, like to read, especially in the area of MarTech. Um, Scott Brinker comes to mind. Um, he's, he's a great, um, you know, educator um, in this arena. Um, definitely 
research from Gartner also comes in very, very handy. Forrester, these research companies that are um, investigating the market marketing technology space in detail. Um, so these are my key go-to resources. Um, our marketing department at Action AQ is actually amazing in consolidating information for us to uh, see what's going on, what type of developments are happening. Uh, now, in terms of leadership resources, um, there are a lot of great networking opportunities. I think there are uh, more and more of, of those uh, available online, but also local organizations, and particularly in New York. I'm in New York, so always on the lookout for specific, you know, industry gatherings, conferences that gives you exposure to market on the one side, um, specific within the specific industry, uh, but also leaders in this industry that um, you know are there and sharing their expertise, um, and you can form connections with. Um, so I would definitely encourage you to look for these local types of engagement outside of large industry conferences. Again, depending on uh, what your where your interests lie, um, and try to make these local connections. Um, anything? Anything else I missed in this question? Any? books or articles that you might recommend as well? Books or articles. Again, the um, articles from, from these influencers in, in particular industry, I think I would definitely recommend um, usual suspects like Harvard Business Review, our uh, periodicals from... Um, UPenn Business School, for oh. example, um, there is a, there is a great person, uh, professor who originated the term of customer lifetime value and really advanced and uh, innovative approach to estimating customer lifetime value. So um, again, for, for the for the industry that I am in. Um, these are very interesting resources to, to follow. Thank you. Our next question says, the VC Vinod Koshia predicts that all jobs will be gone in 25 years. He doesn't necessarily see this as a bad thing, but what are your thoughts? <laughs> hmm. I, my thoughts that it's too short, really especially when you're talking about old jobs, irrespective of industry. Let's forget about marketing and, and analytics. Let's think about, I don't know, doctors, nurses, teachers. Uh, I would argue in 25 years, I don't see AI teaching the kids outside of just maybe giving lecture, but we know that teaching goes way beyond lectures and checking homeworks, right? Especially for younger kids. Um, so there could be some transformations. And again, I think that these transformations in the job functions are very welcome and they would open up opportunities for more creative approach um, to solving societal problems, uh, but they really don't see how they will all be gone. They, they can be transformed and transformed quite significantly. And this is something I absolutely welcome. Thank you. Our next question is about mentorship. It is often highlighted as a crucial component for career growth. Can you share a story about a mentor who influenced your career trajectory? And then what aspects we should look for in a mentor specifically in the AI and MarTech field? 
Uh, well, I can say that I was incredibly lucky uh, throughout my career uh, finding great mentors who were true champions for me. Um, and uh, it, start, it started early in my career um, in financial services when I was at J.P. Morgan Chase. I had a great mentor uh, who was my boss, uh, Kevin Rice, and he was the one who actually demonstrated for the first time uh, how important it is to tell impactful story with the data and how to relate to people without necessarily background in your area, how to relate to them, what you're doing and how it's going to impact them. Um, so he provided a huge support to me in terms of developing this particular skill and he was really inspirational. Um, again, uh, he had great women mentors throughout my career uh, in digital fashion, in media. Uh, they gave me, um, Jessica and Leslie uh, gave me master classes on leadership, really showing how to build the team, motivate the team, how to lead. Um, they were all very direct with their feedback. Um, and I think the great quality in them that helped me was, um, you know, they really wanted me to succeed. So they never sugarcoated anything, uh, provided very direct feedback that was also very actionable. It wasn't just in general, you did great or you really didn't deliver this time. It was more around, this is how you can make it better in this area and these are the specific steps and I will help you here and there. So uh, we could build the plan together and I understood the outcome I was striving for. Um, and I always felt that they're there for me to help me and to guide me. So I think these qualities in mentors are, um, as important or even more important um, in the current state of my career. And uh, that's what I am uh, trying to instill with people who consider myself a mentor to them. But I also wanted to mention that, you know, sometimes when we are saying mentor, we assume that mentor is an older person with more experience. Uh, but I can tell you that working for the past five and a half years in uh, tech startup world, I work with a lot of brilliant people who are younger with, than me and have shorter careers just by the you know virtue of years. Um, but I keep learning from them a lot every day. And I think it's very valuable for anybody to be able to see mentors pretty much across um, um, career ladder and understand where you can learn and um, how to improve yourself and move your career forward irrespective of where the person you're learning from uh, is in their career. We have an audience member who is in fashion sales, forecasting, and merchandise planning. They are wondering how you see AI bridging the data between different functions, as in marketing data, somehow connected to a sales forecast in a dynamic way. Oh, that's actually a super interesting question and something I was intimately engaged in when uh, I worked in di digital fashion. I worked for several years um, for Guild Group, which was one of the uh, flash sale sites. Um, and even though I was, my team, analytics team was a part of marketing, but we worked very closely with uh, finance department and with merchandising department, right? Because analyzing customer data in a vacuum without understanding what exactly they're buying and how this information can inform future buying 
right? And without understanding overall what's the predicted customer lifetime value of our customer portfolio and treating it almost as a financial asset. Um, if you don't do that, then you're not really uncovering all of the opportunities that data can deliver. And it requires some sort of adjustment, right? Because your unit of analysis is different when you're looking at customer versus uh, a merchandise that you're selling, right? But um, there, is the, there is an alignment and education process between the teams that need to happen so they can translate results of the analysis and what things like um, that mean, you know, well, marketing can say, I have X number of customers that spend this much money. So I'm very happy that, you know, from the marketing perspective, I made my plans, but then how do you translate it to the fact that these customers um, actually purchased number of different items across styles was it purchased in retail in store or online what was the most successful channel um, all of this information that's critical for merchandisers how do you tie this information and again tell the story in the way that uh, is relevant across different divisions is is super super important and Again, it's it's an ongoing process, I think, and with developments in AI and machine learning, um, it's becoming more efficient, uh, but conceptually, I think it's very important to have these internal alignments within different between different functions so people can speak the same language and make decisions jointly based on this information. Thank you. Our next question is going back to AI. How do we deal with AI from an ethical perspective? Um, it's a it's a great question that you know, obviously, you see a lot of people are concerned with. Um, and it's a daily. I think it's a daily process because we are not AI, <laughs> we are not machine learning mechanisms, but we also learn, right? I think it's it's important to not make assumptions, but also go through kind of testing and learning process for us as human beings, as we are dealing with new developments in AI, right? Because we can't really come up with a whole list of rules right now saying, well, these are the list, these are the rules that we will make sure AI abides to. I mean, we can on the, at the conceptual level, but not practical level, because we don't know yet before we test how AI will actually react to different tasks and what are the uh, ethical problems. So I think it's it's super important to have guidelines, but understanding how potentially we can put them into practice through uh, ongoing testing and learning. And then our next question asks, could you talk more specifically about what AI tools you already use in your work and how? Uh, so there are certain things uh, within Action AQ that we uh, build into our platform. Right, and they um, deal with different types of machine learning models and predictive analytics. So we help our clients with, again, getting closer and closer to providing customers with the right product through the right channel at the right time. Uh, so we have a set of internal tools that help our clients do that. Um, there are various algorithms that we uh, deploy within our platform. Um, we also work jointly with our clients um, that developed something internally, right? So they have their own tools and they want to scale them up through our platform. So they reach more customers and they put the insights uh, into the hands of their marketers. So we um, 
integrate with these internal tools to make sure that they're all available within the platform. And um, as time progresses, we don't have any generative AI capabilities within our platform just yet, but we are in the process of uh, developing them. Again, the most successful will be, it, it's probably not gonna be based on any open AI type of tools because uh, the most impactful solutions you create are based on um, very specific um, customer data with the business context. So it will be a combination of, uh, you know, our collaborations with customers and um, our internal data scientists that will put these things into place. Thank you. And I think we have one more question. As you embarked on your career, particularly in the initial stages, what were some of the challenges you faced as a woman in the corporate world and how did you navigate them? Um, you know, it's it's been almost, <laughs> it, it's been almost a different world, I would say, right? When I started, uh, working in the corporate world. Um, so on top of all the usual suspects, I think I had some specifics that I brought with myself that um, made the experience somewhat challenging. Uh, you know, pretty shy, heavy accent, immigrant, very different uh, experience growing up from people that I was working with. Um, I didn't like to go out to bars after work. And, and frankly, it was the most popular venue where people connected outside of the office, right? So if you're not a part of it, you're not um, really part of the culture. So there definitely were challenges. Um, I think with time, I just learned to bring more of myself to work, right? Because when I just started, I felt like my personal life and my professional life are two very different worlds and I wouldn't mix and mix them up. And um, I, I wasn't really very open. I mean, I was friendly, but I wasn't really making a lot of connections with people because it, it's hard to make when you're not bringing your full self to whatever situation you're in, right? Um, so it was definitely interesting experience. Um, another point is I saw quite a lot of uh, female role models that were um, at the... Um, mid-level of management, but almost nobody at, at the truly senior executive level. And with time, you just get used to it and don't ever think about yourself as being able to um, advance to very senior position because you don't see anybody who looks like you there, right? So you pretty much accept it as, as a status quo. Um, so this is definitely something that changed over the years, but uh, I think in terms of learning, and I think new generation is, is very different in, in their attitude in this area. Uh, just don't think that you can do it if there is nobody else who looks like you, because there are probably the reasons that have nothing to do with you. Um, and another interesting thing that I definitely changed and it definitely uh, helped me in my career is that, you know, this notion that the woman doesn't really speak up until she's 100% certain that she figured everything out and whatever she says is 100% right, that was me. Like, I would never open my mouth in you know, conversations with uh, other teams or executives until I was absolutely certain that I have absolutely correct answer. Um, 
And while, you know, it's a respectable trait, I think um, it hindered me a lot because people are not used to hearing from you, right? You, you need time to be 100% correct. Um, so I think it's important to start the conversation, right? You don't need to have everything figured out, but, you know, if conceptually you're ready to start discussing the problem, I think it's important to start the conversation and to provide your point of view on how things need to progress um, and just be part of conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and experience and all of your advice with us today. I'd also like to thank our She Open the Door Committee and the CAA for helping make today's conversation such a success. For those in the audience, we hope you would consider volunteering with the CAA to help get fellow alumni and students involved in meaningful initiatives like this. Our next She Open the Door event will be Friday, November 10th. And we would love for you to connect with us on our alumni link on the slide up, up right now. And also to connect with Tamara, her LinkedIn is listed. Um, with that, I hope everyone has a wonderful day and we look forward to seeing you again at the next Ask the Expert session on November 10th. Thank you so much. <laughs>